Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Varga Moyet. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer of UiPath. For those of you who have never heard of us, UiPath is actually the uh, fastest growing enterprise software company in the world. We're a company that was born in Romania and we moved our headquarters to New York in the US in 2017. We have today uh, a presence directly in 30 or so countries with 8,000 customers worldwide. Uh, at $10 billion valuation, we're the global leader of a market uh, called RPA. Uh, RPA stands for Robotic Process Automation. Uh, to explain to you in a simple word what RPA is, RPA is basically a white collar robot. The, despite its name, unlike its brother, the blue collar robot that you see on manufacturing uh, plants, uh, it actually doesn't work in the physical world, but rather does in front of a computer many of the things that a human being can do in front of a computer. It can actually read an email, it can open different applications, it can copy uh, information from one application to the other, and so on and so forth. So uh, imagine another image that I make. If you were to look at the computer screen uh, using uh, RPA, it would be like for those of you who are old enough or have seen old Western movies, there used to be in the corner of the saloon, uh, a piano and this mechanical piano where the piano was playing, but there, were no, there was no pianist in front of it. Uh, so if you were to look at the uh, computer screen uh, using an RPA, you would see the same thing. You would see things happening on the computer screen, but nobody being on, in front of the computer screen. The technology is based fundamentally on an underlying technology that it, it's called computer vision. In other words, this technology understands, quote unquote, uh, the information that is displayed on the screen and based on the script that has been written, uh, knows how to actually do different actions. So it knows if something happens on the screen, it can actually trigger uh, another app, uh, action and so on and so forth. So this is what we do. This is what RPA, it's a key component of automation. It also uh, uh, uses quite a bit of artificial intelligence. And it is one of the most, one of the major technologies for what we call today the digitization. Uh, the question I, that often come to mind is, why are we all of a sudden talking about automation and digitization? Why has it become such an important buzzword? Haven't we been in the last decades, in essence, already digitizing? Haven't we been deploying information system with mainframes and then, uh, you know, uh, mini computers and then the PC uh, and then the network and then the internet and the, you know, so on and so forth. Why all of a sudden is this becoming such an important or such a talked about issue? What is different this time from what we've been doing in the past? In fact, a couple of things are different, and this is why perhaps we're talking about it more than we have in the past. One of the things that is different, if you think a little bit, you know, let's say a decade or two decades ago, at the advent of the internet, the people have started selling uh, using a digital channel, in other words, on the internet. But most people, the internet sale was, let's say, a sideshow still the main go-to market for their product or services, let's say for, for instance, banks, were the traditional channels. But lo and behold, over the years, this side show or this side go-to market channel has been growing at double digit and it is becoming more and more central in the way product and services are delivered. In the meanwhile, some digitally born companies have actually built an entire business model digitally and have been delivering their entire uh, product and services uh, digitally, such as Amazon. And so that is a fundamental acceleration and change. In addition to that, digitization has also started connecting with the physical world. And here I'm talking about internet of things. In fact, car manufacturers, plane engine manufacturers can have in real time information about hardwares that they are selling. So that opens new threats and opportunities for their business model. So all of a sudden the digitization has reached a tipping point where companies are obliged to rethink 
their business model and the way they organize. As an example, if you're a traditional retailer and your model was in franchising, and now all of a sudden you're creating a digital channel, people that buy on your, on your website, on the specific area when you have a franchisee, to whom should the revenue go? Where should the inventory of the product be? And so on and so forth. So we are really looking at something that is different. And also, you're the bank, you're a, an incumbent. You have now a digital a native competitor that has heightened the customer experience of your customers. And you need to be able to answer in kind. And it's becoming much more difficult for you because you have a legacy system. And your legacy system, the digitization that you have done all these decades, were mainly functionally driven. You first have, you know, uh, uh, digitized your manufacturing. Uh, then you deployed uh, information system in your back office systems for, with ERPs. Then you deployed CRMs. Then you de deployed uh, HR uh, software. And all of these things were thought about from a functional perspective. But to be able now to provide this horizontal view, this customer-driven view from order to cash, from uh, order to delivery, you need all of a sudden to think across silos. You need to be able to stitch together all these legacy system and you need to do them in a very agile way and a very rapid way because business environment changes super fast a case in point covid who would have even imagined something like this a couple of months ago all of a sudden something happens and you need to respond very fast as an example our technology has been deployed very fast by banks hospitality industry, airlines, government, and hospitals, all of which had all of a sudden an immense need. Banks needed, for instance, in Romania or in the US to postpone loan installments. So they had hundreds of thousands of clients calling them at, at once. So in Romania, for instance, OTP Bank has deployed our automation and was able to bring the simple request for a postponement, postponement of a loan payment from 10 minutes to 20 seconds. And they were able to cope with an increase of 125% in demand. We have helped banks in the US deliver a 90% time, 90 time reduction of the process loan application to be able to support the Paycheck Protection Program. We have helped government such as the uh, ANPIS, which delivers the unemployment benefits in, in Romania to handle in a single month of May 100, 110,000 requests. But more importantly, we have helped also hospitals. We have helped the Matter Hospital in Dublin, where the COVID-19 testing sites uh, require, was consuming 50, up to 50% of nurses' time in administrative tasks as they had the obligation to report, to report every day all the results of their testing. By automating that or giving that task to a robot, they were able to save 18 hours per week, 18 hours that nurses could actually spend with patients instead of doing administrative work. So we see that there is a need for rapid deployment of automation and change. Now, when we talk about robot automation and change and all of these things and artificial intelligence, the thing that everybody is worried about is obviously jobs. The minute we talk about artificial intelligence, robot, is this the end of work? And the answer is, will this, will this technology destroy jobs? The, truth the truthful answer is yes and no. Yes, they will destroy certain type of jobs, definitely, like every other technology before it has done. But they will also create new jobs, again, like every other technology waves before it has done. And you may ask yourself, why is that? Why is it that at the end of the day, somehow technology net creates job? And it has to do with two fundamental reasons. The first being that technology creates new needs that we didn't even have before. Did we ever had the need for social media before we invented it? Did we have the need for TV before we invented it? 
And when both this technology came, plethora of jobs came along to be able to make them function. But also technology answers uh, new needs, uh, old needs in a new way. Old needs in the new way is uh, you have, uh, you need to take money from the ATM bank and you take money from the bank and all of a sudden you have ATM machines and ATM machines are a new way of doing it. No bank teller job would disappeared. There's a new fundamental way of getting your money whenever you want at any time automated. So I will leave you with this thought. This is what we do. This is why technology, you should be very hopeful. It does create new job, but it does require reskilling. And that will be the challenge, not only for private companies, but most likely also for government to be able to reskill the people so that they can answer the challenge of the new technology. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, we're starting the last session for today focused on a sector before we move to talking about uh, what media think. Uh, now I have a, uh, a panel of uh, four uh, experts. We're going to focus on innovation and digital transformation. A moment ago, we heard uh, Varga giving us an outline of uh, robotic process automation and how that uh, affects uh, businesses. In our session now, we're going to look a little bit more at the social aspects of that uh, automation, innovation, digitalization. Um, I have, a, like I said, I have a great panel with me uh, today, so I would like to introduce them to you. Uh, I'll start with Yaroslav uh, Ponder, head of head for Europe at EIT. Uh, sorry. ITU, uh, International Telecommunications Union, uh, a, an EU body. Uh, I have uh, Victor Pereda, uh, as the CEO of Nearsoul. And I have two gentlemen here with me in the studio in Warsaw. And this is uh, Jerzy Brodzikowski, General Manager at Cambridge Innovation Center. And I also have Paweł Jakubik from Microsoft. So uh, we were, like I said, we were talking about, you know, automation and, and how that affects business. But uh, I, I like reminding myself about, you know, what Professor Harari said a couple of, well, almost a year ago now at Davos, uh, when he said that technological advancements are actually very helpful and are able to change our lives for the better, obviously, but they might sometimes be detrimental as well to our lives. And... Um, I have a feeling that when we look at what is in general going on around, not everyone understands those, uh, you know, disruptions, those, te those technological disruptions, uh, and how they might affect uh, people going forward. Do you share my uh, view, or do you have a different opinion, gentlemen? I'm opening the, uh, you know, uh, I'm asking any one of you to uh, start with their thoughts. Maybe. Maybe I would uh, kick off uh, the discussion. Uh, thank you very much for raising this. Uh, we are the UN specialized agency for ICTs. So for many years, we have been advocating for power, enabling power of the ICTs uh, to be applied uh, in the business processes, but more importantly, to be also used by the population. Uh, and uh, we have been doing this with the great success, but I think the biggest success came when uh, the COVID came, uh, where we started to see that uh, people are not uh, requested, encouraged, but they are forced by the reality. Uh, and of course, uh, from day A to B, uh, those who are unexperienced uh, users of the ICTs uh, became or were forced to become the proficient user of the ICTs, and it was not possible to uh, to drive this digital transformation so fast. So that's why uh, we had a lot of reactions uh, to this rapid um, rapid um, digital transformation force coming uh, to to so many people. Uh, in general, of course, it triggered a lot of good work at the government level. Uh, it was understood that there is no way back, uh, that uh, digital transformation is reality. We have to uh, learn how to go around this. Uh, many of 
the governments and the stakeholders recognize the lack of the digital skills uh, in the populations. I think as the global organization uh, tracking the level of the digital skills at the global level, still Europe appears like being really ahead of the other regions, but still demonstrating that over 40% of the population doesn't have any digital skills. It's not prepared to the any type of the digital transformation. What we also observe not only by the people working in the services, but also by some educators who from uh, immediately were forced to introduce uh, the e-learning um, frameworks uh, with a bigger or a smaller success uh, at the end of them, but more importantly, by the end of the children and some of them being able to really accommodate and to have the uh, fervor schooling continue, uh, uh, while some others unfortunately were abandoned because certain as social aspects were not taken into account. Uh, the statistics showing the availability of the PC per household uh, maybe is showing great picture, but once we are diving in particular to some countries with the, uh, with the lesser of the economic power, uh, we will notice that the position of the internet access, position of the PC at home, one PC at home, is already a success. And with the family, with the three children, which child should uh, continue with the schooling? So definitely, um, the, we observed accelerated process of the digital transformation, extremely big social impact uh, on the uh, people, encouraging them to become the digitally savvy and uh, excellent response of the different sectors uh, to this challenge, becoming more interested than ever how to integrate the digital component in their service delivery. But I will come back to this uh, by the next so occasion. Harari is actually talking about, uh, you know, creating a useless class, um, creating or leading to data colonialism. Is there a danger of that, really? Gentlemen? Maybe I will, I will, I will try. I think with this data colonization, it's something overestimated in my op opinion because I think data management, it's not new model because we are managing data over the last two decades, but data accelerated a lot. This portion of data, what now is terabyte, petabyte, it's so massive what we what we have. We don't need traditional data warehouse because finally we have cloud comp computing. Thanks to cloud, we are managing data. Yeah. On the previous panel, I've I've heard one very smart sentence ab about digital sovereignty. Mm -hmm. That's mean how to build really this security on the on the data. And I I think behind Harari uh, narration, I can imagine that in his 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 mind that there's a Having this big tech domination now on this, you know, four or five big technology or organization, where also my my company is one of the biggest leader now, we have to really work how to convince world that data security, data privacy is in place. We have tons of materials, analysts and lawyers and, you know, partners and, of course, cooperation with European Union, with Safe Harbor, with Cloud Act issue. A lot of things we have behind data. data. But in the end of the, of the day, it's landing on the country. That's why I am proud that as a Poland, we have now this two big investment made by Google and Microsoft, where thanks to this investment, Many sensitive data generated by Polish companies, by, by Polish orga organization, will stay in our our country. It will be no no any export of of data, and it's building kind of perception of the security. Yeah? On the other hand, having the, the the previous statement on the remote work and the, on the e-learning, I wanna challenge slightly that we shouldn't 
cheat ourselves that remote work, it's a digital transformation. Guys, remote work is a very trivial and very simple applications. Zoom, Meet, Hangouts, Teams, WebEx, the list of leaders. This is the, this is the video con conferencing. This is the uh, work, workflow. This is a simple, you know, document management system applications. The real transformation is starting what is next behind this re remote work. COVID, COVID time shows that transformation based on this remote work ex explosion is possible because these previous blockers been resolved and, and you know, the, the breakout due, due to COVID, that COVID push for, 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 for us to, to really prepare this hybrid mode. And by the way, guys, we, we have some analysis on the Polish market that on the e-learning system, this is what my colleagues said before, how many PCs per, per, per house, how many uh, kids can, can have access. For me, the, one of the largest surprise was the analysis, how many Polish teachers been ready in March to start using personal computer. And... Really, it was 34% Polish teachers be not ready to use laptops. Right. Laptops, yeah. It, it was, it, it was an, an issue. And really, a lot of companies organizing on a, some fast track to, to meet some assistants, some partners, organizations, some system integ integ integrators to support. But in the end of the day, I think remote work this is the beginning. Digital transformation begins on the much more heavy projects like paperless, like this what UiPath is representing. By the, by the way, guys, respect to this Romanian company. This is one of the examples of the Eastern Europe unicorn. Decacorn. Which is, you know, doing so great job on worldwide level, showing the potential of, of Eastern Euro Europe talents, yeah? So th this is uh, my first uh, part. Thank you. Yes, what's your take on that? I think the the one phrase that was missing from pre two previous speakers regarding this is digital divide. I think that kind of defines what you gentlemen were talking about. And um, from my perspective, uh, the numbers of teachers, how many teachers could use the computer, how many households, how many computers per household, all those numbers uh, show that it's great that things have sped up, but at the same time, maybe it's not that great that they sped up at this time. Maybe in five years, it would have been a little bit better because we're going through a, we've been going through a digital, I would say, revolution for the last 15, 20 years that, you know, uh, Moore's law and the, the increase of, of processing power of 0.5 um, uh, times 0.5 every year, uh, that's also increasing. But I think the slowest of all of the a slowest element of the entire digital revolution that we're going through is actually the human aspect and the fact that we're not as fast as technology. And one of the elements of, of, of this discussion, I hope, is going to be also uh, the fundamentals of uh, policy making related to uh, digital revolutions as well. And the fact is that technology develops very quickly, the things around it don't. And that's the biggest issue that we, we're facing right now. That we that's, have to that's a very interesting point. Are policymakers, you know, starting to see the need to speed up, basically? And uh, I would also like to ask uh, uh, Victor uh, what's his take on what we've been talking about so far. Yeah, uh, I, I agree with, with what everybody said. I think that technology is moving too fast, and, and people are too slow still to to react. Uh, you you see it uh, like you know going back to the numbers. Uh, a lot of teachers, and you're talking about first world countries, right? Uh, that were 34 percent did not know how to use a, a laptop. So you go to other other regions, and that that percent is it's huge, right? So you're gonna see this transform, and and at some point, people will will be behind what what uh you know how everything is how quickly moving it, it's moving, right? So. I think there's going to be some policies. I think that the, the government really has to push because technology is here and it's, it's here to stay and it's always going to continue to to grow and 
and if at the schools and if at even in your household you're not ready to for something like this it's 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 really gonna um how do you call it uh, uh it, it's gonna slow you down when it comes to to living right so even even our agents were the, the guys that work for us they weren't ready right even uh even pre-COVID, uh, if the if things we if we, if we would have said, "Hey, can you guys work from home?" There was no possibility, all right. Uh, and having to transition so many people to a work-at-home environment, it was it was very difficult for a lot of the companies, right? And again, and I'm talking about other regions where where technology is is not as good as as, as in Europe. And a, a lot of companies did well, and a lot of companies have failed and are are losing a lot of business because they were not ready for for this. I guess pandemic, but not not so much pandemic, but this digital transformation to come in so quickly. So, if we were to come up with a solution here, how to make you know both governments, but also individuals, because I think it has to go go both ways. It has to go from up to bottom, uh, or from top to bottom, but also from the bottom up. How to make that happen? Could I? And I'm opening uh, that. To- could I- could I, yeah, could yes. I, yeah, thank sure. you, thank you. Uh, so, well, my point is maybe coming back to your question uh, regarding how the policymakers are and the regulators are dealing with the cross-sectoral challenge of the digital transformation. Um, and I recall when we, as the ITU, were setting up the United Nations Broadband Commission, inviting the leaders of the world active in different sectors and um, it was uh, over 10 years ago, uh, it was some sort of the innovation that we were advocating, look, broadband is really growing, this will revolutionize your business delivery. Uh, And the first step the government, each government has to make is uh, to have the clear strategy, which will not be sector silo oriented, but which would, in fact, at the level of the government, at the level, uh, mainly prime minister level, would create a coordination mechanism to make understanding that the agriculture, education, health needs uh, good uh, access, but also good computing power, good IT system, and so on. This was that time. Uh, Currently, we we made the second step, uh, taking a look uh, at the work the regulators, ICT regulators, uh, are doing. And um, we concluded recently with our uh, new product uh, on the Global Regulatory Outlook uh, Tracker um, uh, that uh, we developed the framework uh, taking a look at the first generation, second, third, fifth generation, which in fact is the regulator's approach involving uh, the all utilities into the discussion and making sure that the regulation is not only dedicated to the uh, ICT sector, but also involves the other sectors, creating the synergies between those. Um, uh, and the results are not that great. We are still not there. In Europe, around, um, you know, out of my portfolio of the 46 countries, only 10 countries are complying with the fifth generation of regulation principles. Uh, so what shows that still we are in the process of adaptation uh, to uh, the reality of uh, requirements of the digital transformation to accelerate this uh, to the level that we can say, yes, we have the one ecosystem of the digital uh, world. Uh, So still a lot of work is uh, to be done. And I don't want to talk about the other uh, regions, which are still in the third level of the generation of regulation uh, and only entering into the the fourth. So I think that uh, if, if just to conclude, I think this is very important uh, that we have the leaders at the level of the government who have the vision, who can also use such opportunities like pandemics and to bring the issue to the table and to push it. Um, Just one uh, last example. Recently, we were working on the digital agriculture in some transition economies of Europe. This is the place where the uh, big amount of the uh, population is living. Uh, and we just noticed that, in fact, a uh, digital component doesn't exist there. So it shows uh, that we have to create the bridges and cultivate them. And um, also, it has to be done together, hand in hand with the private sector. And the governments cannot do this um, uh, themselves. 
So I have a question regarding this, you know, those leaders with a vision. Do we actually have them and do you see them? Because it feels like, I mean, if I try to listen to the public debate, I don't really hear much of 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 that vision you know to to uh accelerate this uh digital digital transformation process well it depends which element of the dig- digital transformation process we're talking about for example using you for example you know empowering the the people because i think we've been talking about you know how little the people are prepared to to benefit from digital transformation so that's what i'm talking about so i think in the cities this is not such major of an issue because cities have developed uh, to to the extent where everybody pretty much has a computer a tablet a, a, a cell phone which provides you with opportunities to learn to communicate to do work uh, per se uh, I think the divide, which I mentioned, I mentioned before, uh, is in the rural areas, and and that's where where uh, policymakers really need to step in and find ways to uh, empower uh, empower uh, communities to uh, to um, uh, basically develop potentially technologies that will um, help rural rural areas and and. Um, basically communicate them better with, with the rest of the developed world. And I don't want to make statements here that, for example, in the east of Poland, um, the I would say the ICT sector is weaker because actually there's a lot of software houses over there which are highly valued. But, you know, around them, there are a lot of neighborhoods where potentially there isn't a lot of technology. So you can go both ways, I guess. One is subsidies and, and provide ways, governmentally sponsored subsidies that will uh, enable these people to have access to uh, technology. Or we can go the other way, uh, free market uh, version of, of this. And, and this is probably through um, larger corporations which see a potential uh, benefit, commercial benefit of having these people have access to technologies. Pavel? My opinion is that having Eastern Europe, we are still on, on the learning mode in, in here. And, but we have some first examples. And being really many times in the US, I, I was on a very big number of events, conferences, discussions. And there is also some discussions where I, I've, I've had even in, in U.S. that we need stronger leaders on, on the digital transformation. So it's, it's not our, our pain only, only here. I want to maybe recall two, two, two things. Two months ago, it was a report made by DESA of the digital maturity on the Europe le- level. Poland took 23rd, 23rd uh, place. Uh, so one of of the last most of the europe in eastern europe uh, countries been in the, in the in the second part of the of the report it was a very interesting that it was a two line of the uh, digital uh, transformation where poland was in the part of leaders it was some infrastructure and connectivity that's mean that our 4g i want to name not not 5g but 4g is very solid we we improve a lot of and I wanna really said big big thank you to to all big Polish telecoms what we did in especially in in COVID time yeah how many you know houses we we've been able to add to the net network and the second was so one was con- connectivity and second was infra infrastructure but the rest we are far uh, far away on the other hand. Initiative this this new national cloud operator, which was established by PKO Bank Polski and Polski Fundusz Dozwoju Polish Development Investment Fund. Development Fund. This is an example that we are being building this digital leadership here. Mm-hmm. And led by example, we did some great uh, exercise on the PKO, which was also uh, uh, announced in the in the, in the public space that. They did some exercise how to prepare road to digital transformation, road to cloud. They they hired, of, of course, worldwide consultant. It was Boston Consulting Group. And they prepared super solid material where I think we can use in this country this as a benchmark because mm-hmm. it, it shows because, guys, Polish banking system never was a shame for us. It's yes. In 90s and in 2000 decade, we, we built 
kind of leaders like Mbank, you know, ING, Inteligo, then then Eco. So we 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 have these examples, but it was kind of pre-digital transformation era. And now we have to build something new. And I think that we have a chance because our legacy is not so big like in, in Western Europe or, or in EU. US. Of course, we should maybe take some examples from Asia, from Singapore, from Thailand, from Japan, how, how they are building di- digital transformation. I strongly believe that cloud will be one, one of, the, of, of this main engine because cloud is releasing and avoiding this extra investment in advance. And you can make a lot of trials on, 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 on cloud. So I believe that cloud will be this acceleration. But on the other hand, but maybe we'll dis- discuss this later, we need education and we need skilling, guys, because this is something what we have a big gap. So that, that, that is exactly what I was going to ask about, because you meant, oh, we saw UiPath, and this is clearly a, you know, an example of uh, entrepreneurial spirit uh, coming from emerging Europe. And uh, is, there, is there a way of creating this need, this entrepreneurial spirit again, or maybe fostering or maybe accelerating that somehow, so we can see more examples of this and seeing actually younger people wanting to learn, uh, wanting to be mo- more, uh, you know, digital, uh, more tech savvy and so on. And th- again, this is a, a question. My questions are always <coughs> open to all the, uh, per- all, all the panelists. If you wish, <laughs> I can kick off uh, this uh, as well. Uh, so ITU is quite experienced with uh, the supporting the innovation. Uh, But uh, a few years back, uh, many countries came to the ITU saying, um, please support us in creating the so-called ICT-centric innovation ecosystem. It's not about uh, supporting the country to open the uh, innovation center, which is glossy once it's opened, and then three months later is diet, okay? I travel a lot and I've seen a lot of examples where uh, you know, leaders are, are proud of this, what they open, um, being convinced that it were, it's running. It's not running uh, because you have to prepare the system to enable uh, the entrepreneurs, enable private sector and to interact, to have open dialogue with the um, government and not being also afraid of this, what, um, what comes out of the uh, demands, clear demands uh, and articulated constraints why the innovators, for example in many countries of Balkan states, prefer to, after the graduation to go to the US uh, and uh, seek uh, the future there instead of staying and uh, being patriotic and building uh, the country uh, in the other way. Uh, so uh, we have supported several countries uh, already now in the setting up the system which allows them to think more system-wise rather than ad hoc actions which are fancy but in the long term doesn't give any, uh, any results. Uh, so, so that's why we, we strongly advocate always uh, to, uh, to have this ecosystem also created not only for the entrepreneurs but uh, it requires also engagement of financial system, uh, also engagement of the academia um, and uh, proper skills. And here I, I'm coming also to, to the issue of the, uh, of the skills of the future. I don't know if you will be touching upon this in the next question. Uh, if yes, then I will hold my statement. Go on, go on. Yeah, I can, can go in. Uh, so, um, so for us, we notice significant challenge in terms of the work of the countries in the, in particular, in the uh, Eastern Europe, on the development of the digital skills and the systemic approach. Uh, we are currently in the middle of uh, the. Uh, of the study where we are going from country to country to see, in fact, what are the national approaches. All these countries are saying digital is our future. But if you are asking them, do you know what skills you need, how many, you have the open dialogue with the private sector, what they would like you, 
to prepare uh, for them through the public education system, what type of the skills should be uh, ready to deploy by them, it doesn't exist. So in many countries, when we are arriving uh, to the interviews, uh, the issue is you have the academia, which is very proud of the system, and you have private sector, which after the meeting very often is saying, well, this everything is great, we have great cooperation, but you know, we have the six months program to reskill people, to adjust to our real needs. Uh, so it shows that you know there is some gap which has to be closed, and we hope that uh, with the support of different stakeholders, and this is also open invitation to the, our consortium, which we are building for the nine countries of Eastern Europe, uh, to uh, first help the countries to make the proper assessment uh, of the digital skills. We launched the uh, guidebook uh, how to proceed with the assessment to be also harmonized in this. Um, in this uh, context across uh, the, the region uh, and also to identify what we have to prepare for uh, digital, real digital transformation still to come because this what we have is only the, uh, I think, um, uh, the introduction of the digital uh, world, what we will experience in the future. So I would like to ask Victor about his uh, you know, opinion on the skill uh, gap. And then the final question, we don't have much time, unfortunately. The final question would be how the U.S., how, how can the U.S. actually help emerging Europe uh, you know, accelerate? So Victor, just briefly on the skill gap, if you could. Yeah, I, I think the skill gap, <clears throat> excuse me, the skill gap is, is, is there. Uh, and unless the, the, the government, I think, does subsidies or incentivize uh, private entities for them to manage it, I think that's where you will see that the real change. You see, you know, a lot of programs and a lot of, you know, different initiatives are, that get started by someone that does not understand technology. And they think they're doing a, a good job at it. And then, uh, like you guys mentioned, you know, six months down the line, that project is, is done because they never understood what they were trying to do. They thought it was a... Uh, a, a great idea that's going to make them look good in front of people, but at the end of the day, they really didn't understand. So I think it's uh, it's really privatizing the, the education so we can get the skill set there because technology, like I said previously, it's moving too fast and we need to adjust to it. And if we don't you know, put the, the, the education in place, it's going to get to a point where it's going to have to stall because we, we're not going to be able to follow it. Mm-hmm. Gentlemen? Yeah, maybe... I will add two two things. I remember a year ago when I was in the U.S. to convince our decision makers in Redmond to uh, invest this $1 billion investment to the public cloud infrastructure in, in Poland. It's, it was one condition from them. I remember in the, in the end, one of the COOs said to me, okay, but in this portion, we will dedicate a special budget for skilling retraining, upskilling for universities. So now in next two years, we are, we are going to skill 150,000 programmers and, and um, IT people. It's not, not only Python, not only cloud, not, not, not only Azure. That is a new, new trend, guys, because I want to also stay you with one sentence for the future. There is a group of application named low-code or no-code application where we don't need programmers. And that is an explosion now. On, in our offer, it's a Power BI, Power Apps, and Power Platform where some business user can use and, and prepare applications without any IT support. And we expect here massive development on on this and this is the part of of the education by the way we are uh, skilling not only technical universities we have some you know humanistic and some some really universities where is non-technical studies where we we have some courses of python and exactly this non-code applications so and i Remember this year ago, this guy said to me, okay, business case on this one billion is made to Poland, but remember that this, that is a free seas. That is a free seas, 11 countries, 125 million people. Please take care about Hungary, about Balkans, about Baltics. So we are now on the way to expand some of these programs also for other countries. Thank you. Yes, so 
from my perspective, I think uh, I'm, I'm, I actually represent the non-formal education of entrepreneurship. Uh, I have the pleasure to, to uh, represent uh, Cambridge Innovation Center, which is an American uh, Boston-based um, um, global community of entrepreneurs. And, and in Warsaw, we just established a, year, a month and a half ago, uh, something which we refer to as Innovation Campus, which is an o- both open and closed place where you can just uh, come over and be a part of the larger ecosystem that we've spoke to uh, here. And from my perspective, apart from the systemic solutions that were mentioned here, the non-systemic one is disruption. It's also a double-edged sword. There's good things about it. There's bad things about it. But overall, if we want to speed up the process of, of digital um, revolution of this transformation that we're talking about is we need to have people around us who do the same thing. So we need to have centers of innovation, such as the one that I have, I'm happy to represent, where you have uh, different uh, atoms with different ideas colliding and building new things. So in the end, it's human interaction that will change things. But we definitely, I think my takeaway from this session would be that we clearly have to speed up and try to keep up with, uh, with how technology is uh, changing and how disruptive it is. Uh, thank you very much, gen- very much, gentlemen, for this session, for this excellent chat. And uh, we're finishing now and uh, we're connecting with our... Uh, journalist and with Liz Kleiman uh, from Fox Business, who is going to, who is going to chair this uh, session called "Let's the Media Talk." Thank you very much.